Awesome. So I'm Kuba. I work at Yelp. A um, couple of words uh, about Yelp. Uh, I think probably most of you know what Yelp is uh, doing. We are connecting people with great local businesses. And um, that pretty much uh, grew over the past 14 years to having 6,000 employees worldwide and a um, handful of offices. Uh, I think in the US we have like five offices in different states and then uh, two overseas offices in Hamburg and London, where actually I just flew in from on Saturday. I was there for last week. A um, couple words about me. Um, so I, I joined Yelp in July 2014, and I actually started in the Yelp London office. So uh, since um, December 2015, I'm uh, working out our headquarters in San Francisco. And the free time, I like cycling and skiing. So. Um, uh, what is actually corporate security team? What is our uh, mission at Yelp? So we uh, I picked up a couple of projects that we are working on um, on an ongoing basis and also uh, some projects that we, we just finished or uh, are actually planning to work on in the near future. So the first one is Malware Incident Response. This is sort of like our ongoing effort to respond to any incoming uh, antivirus alerts or any sort of like endpoint monitoring systems that we have um, deployed at Yelp. And um, once we receive alerts from, from the systems, we have to respond and provide some sort of analysis and remediation for uh, the, uh, the alerts there. Um, sort of follow-up project is incident response process automation. So basically, a lot of tasks in malware incident response are actually manual uh, and sort of one off, but then you see some patterns and you start repeating the same manual actions and again and again. And again. So it seems like a good idea to automate them. So we put some time um, also for automating this uh, common uh, processes that we have uh, developed over the malware incident response um, tasks. Another ongoing effort, phishing incident response. So this is. Um, a little, very similar to malware incident response, but more focused on actually phishing attempts that our employees are uh, receiving on their, uh, through their email or, for instance, uh, voicemail and so on. Uh, one project that we just recently finished that was uh, motivated by the, um, some of our uh, penetration testing findings uh, last year was Active Directory password blacklisting, so actually providing a capability for um, the passwords that we're using for our laptops to, to blacklist them. And uh, at the very end of the presentation, I'll talk about security education, so some efforts that we are doing um, related to security awareness among our employees. Uh, so to start with, malware response process at a glance. Uh, so I divided it into three phases that are quite um, clear when it comes to like how are we actually responding to incoming alerts. So the first sort of part that's uh, actually automated, uh, but sometimes there, there is also like some, some manual out-of-band alerting uh, involved is detection. So how are we actually detecting the um, sort of interesting from the security situations in our infrastructure? So we have a bunch of uh, tools that are helping us out with that, bunch of um, shiny toys on our infrastructure, antiviruses, um, endpoint protection systems, uh, firewalls, and so on. The sort of mo mo the, 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 the part of the process that's, that's most time consuming is the analysis part. So that's where we actually spend time on analyzing um, what the threat is, where it came from, and how do we, what sort of remediations we want to provide. And the last part is actually providing the remediation. We are less involved in this part. We provide the action items for our awesome uh, helpless technicians, site support people, and they're actually the ones taking over um, the, the remediation actions on uh, the machines that our employees are using. So yeah, as I mentioned, the uh, detection, this is basically um, incoming alerts from various uh, variety of sources like antiviruses. We use uh, also uh, open source endpoint monitoring software called OS Query that was uh, developed by Facebook and currently is actually um, available on, I think, on GitHub as, as part of uh, their uh, open source um, landscape. 
network traffic monitoring, we use a couple of vendors for that. So basically, they are both active as like in, in firewalls in line with our ongoing traffic from and to um, the public internet, but also, for instance, network taps that are observing our mirrored traffic to um, also provide some analysis of the traffic and discover, for instance, if someone is downloading a malicious file from, from the internet. Uh, we also have a large um, security incident and event management cluster that is built on Elasticsearch, and we also use Splunk, which are two systems for collecting and analyzing logs. And basically, this uh, cluster combines all of the different logs that we receive from these systems um, and gives us capability to build alerts on top of the data and also sort of cross-correlate the data from, from a variety of sources and provide some more meaningful analysis based on <coughs> And the last sort of um, more manual, I guess, uh, alerting sources, for instance, through email or people just come to our desk or open Jira ticket for us in our um, issue tracking system and let us know about something weird that they observed on their machine, like some weird adware or pop-ups showing up. So this is an example of what actually we or, or actually our infrastructure sees when it comes to antivirus alert. So um, this is something that um, is encoded in sort of JSON format. So uh, each alert will look similar to that. It will have some common fields like uh, where actually the event happened. So I think this inserted or event time is actually the, the timestamp for that event, the, the machine name and uh, what, which file path is this pertaining to. Um, OS query, I mentioned earlier, uh, this is open source tool that allows us to query operating system uh, for this set of information. So kernel extension, user logins, uh, config file hashes, browser extensions, startup items, and uh, some launch daemons. Uh, what is actually interesting about OS query is that it um, doesn't really provide any alerting. Uh, on its own, it's just like a sort of a, if you, if you know SQL-like uh, database to, to query this operating system uh, parameters. And there is possibility also to collect and gather all this data in a central place. So that's what we are doing. We are collecting it in, into our uh, SIM cluster. And it also allows us to look for changes in configuration files, for instance. So that way we can figure out where something was changed, like some, some malicious extension was installed, for instance, or some new uh, startup item uh, popped up on the system. We can uh, get to know uh, about this event and try to analyze that. So there is no alerting built into OS query, but we have actually open source uh, alerting tool that alerts out of elastic search indexes so that's something we are utilizing to uh, prepare alerts from uh, from our sim cluster if you're interested you can check out the the source code on github basically what last alert does is it queries the index so all of the logs in the in the sim cluster and based on certain conditions it triggers an alert that can either for instance uh, send you an email um, page you in the paging system, we, we use PagerDuty, or for instance, create a, an issue in the issue tracking system like Jira. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, well, you still get a lot of, like, you know, different systems, typically you get a lot of false positive mm -hmm. response, so do you get that and how do you deal with it? You yeah. Know, like, you can share a lot so the question is about the whether we get false positives in our system. So yeah, that, that's obviously the case there there is lots of false positives and i would say uh, yeah like the, the sort of very first part of responding to any incident is also like figuring out whether this is actually a real alert a real threat or um, whether it's only a false positive situation yeah something that we Th that don't. makes the automation so hard right i mean it's like typical you kind of like someone who's eyeball scams say whether it's false positive yeah. experience and, and i'm just kind of curious it's like your automation it, like how do you tackle that or yeah so how do we tackle it in the in the automation so um i'll talk a little bit later in the in the presentation, but basically, um, we th there is a way to influence this alerting source and provide, for instance, some sort of filtering, like whitelisting or blacklisting. It would help us to.
to at least um, filter out this situations that we know about our false positives. So in the last alert, for instance, this will boil down to preparing a specific filter that will basically ignore uh, the conditions that we know are causing false positives. So uh, I'll show later, I think I have probably an example of a last alert rule, but it has like a possibility to write down, a, but basically it's based on a query for the Elasticsearch data. So you can augment the query to um, filter out the, the things that you know are false positives. You had a question? Um, yeah, I'm just curious. Um, so a lot of the endpoint protecting stuff and uh, even the monitoring stuff really didn't have any kind of protection for like zero day stuff like WannaCry. And I'm wondering how you're dealing with kind of the adaptive nature of this stuff. Like the last place that I was at, they had a special console where they were watching SMB name changes on files, especially Excel files, because that's one of the behaviors that, that kind yeah. of jumps out when something like that kicks off. Like, just kind of, you know. Yeah, so uh, the question is how we are dealing basically with zero days, like some, some unknown type of threats that haven't been seen before. And uh, actually, when Sam asked me to, 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 to talk, I was thinking about doing talk specifically about this um, sort of scenario. It's, uh, I think it's like sort of in the buzzword mode, mode right now. It's, uh, people refer to it as threat hunting. Mm. So this is a little bit more like active, actively looking for uh, malicious or maliciously looking suspicious actions. Mm. And yeah, it's, it's very hard to detect it via means automated alerts. Uh, we use a software called Next Generation Antivirus uh, provided by CrowdStrike, CrowdStrike Falcon. So that's sort of um, what they claim they are doing. They're actually preparing, like observing such uh, anomalous um, events in the, in the systems. But um, yeah, it's, it's, it's hard and it's not something that's like uh, very easy to uh, prepare for. And, yeah, on the, on the second part of that question was you're an, obviously an internet company like you how do you deal with um, the malware that I mean I, I know you probably have firewalls and filters on that stuff but there's a certain percentage of the stuff that's just memory resonant that never hits the disk and all of your endpoint protecting stuff is kind of useless against web pages that are malicious that haven't been blacklisted so far like what do you do in those cases so uh, yeah, how do we protect against like memory only or in memory yeah. malware? Um, yeah, I don't have like a very good answer in terms of what sort of tools are providing which capabilities. Yeah. Um, I agree, it's, it's generally hard to, to do it on the endpoint protection level. I think what we, uh, like one piece of our sort of protection is either well firewalling or a DNS resolution filter. So we assume that we, we sort of like delegate the job of like protecting us against these threats to someone else, like DNS provider. And we assume that they already get to know that about the threats and they are blocking it. Uh, but yeah, we don't like actively scan memory or um, I guess one idea could be to have some periodic um, memory snapshots and try to analyze that, but I think it will be very like heavy in terms of um, computational power necessary to sure. like first like transfer the image to like central place to analyze it. So yeah, you can have a complete VDI environment, have it up in the cloud, take snapshots. But yeah, kind of yeah, ridiculous to manage. <laughs> Cool. Uh, so here is actually an example of how this um, aerial, uh, how the line from OS query is um, so, like transformed by Elast Alert to provide us with the uh, alert. So in this case, we scripted an alert to um, fire whenever there is a new. Chrome extension installed on the machine uh, that is uh, matching this window resizer, I think, name 
Um, so Chrome extensions are uh, also having this unique identifiers, as you can see here, by this random string um, of data. And we basically base the alert on, on this unique, what they call IOCs, indicators of compromise, so, so um, sort of um, pieces of information, signatures that will allow us to um, find this um, suspicious or maliciously looking uh, Chrome extensions in the, in, the, in the list of the extensions that people have installed on their machines. So Elast Alert has, um, Elast Alert rules uh, have a couple of different sources or uh, types of um, data inputs that they can alert on. So we can have uh, alerts based on frequency of certain events or spikes in uh, certain events that are happening, or for instance, if there are no events, flatline, uh, there can be also alert based on that. And we can have like predefined rolling time frames in these alerts to take a look at specific um, time windows uh, when it comes to where, where the event happened. Um, so right now I want to talk a little bit more about the very specific type of uh, data we collect. So we collect uh, DNS resolution logs so we know which domains people requested in our environment. So thanks to that, we can uh, we, we come up with the alert that will fire when we see people uh, or machines actively browsing uh, blocked domains. Um, so from one of our from from the DNS provider that we are using, they they actually uh, proactively block certain domains that they deem malicious, and they also let us know um, about the domains that they blocked. So we can. Um, so we have basically a list of domains that people visit and information whether they were blocked or not. And we scripted an alert uh, in the last alert to notify us whenever we see a spike in machine, uh, certain machine has a spike in visiting blacklisted uh, domains. So in this case, uh, such alert would look like this. Uh, it's not that readable here. Basically, there is like a counter of how many visits were to a particular domain. and. Um, in this case, uh, we automated it to, to also provide us with better indicators of which of these domains are actually more malicious. Uh, and one particular domain um, stands out there. So uh, basically, when we see such alert, we follow the steps. So like analyzing whether it's false positive or not. So uh, how sort of like through all this list of domains, analyze whether there is something wrong with the machine or not. Um, whether it's a uh, wrong operating system, so this is more particular for antivirus alerts. For instance, if you have a file signature from Windows operating system, something like a malicious executable, that's not really um, something you can um, execute on Mac OS system. It's not that big of a threat. Obviously, it's good to clean it up and figure out where it came from. Um, but uh, as like Mac OS heavy shop, we don't really care that much about um, Windows executables on Mac machines. Um, another piece of, of information that might be interesting in the analysis phase is whose machine actually is it, just to figure out, for instance, if it's a person from finance, actually they're using Windows machines, that might be a little bit more <laughs> interesting for us to, to analyze that threat. And uh, yeah, like the pretty much like the most important part of it is actually to figure out how this how the the, the malware get there in the first place and trying to block this um, this way. If it was from a particular domain that's malicious, we can block it at the DNS resolution level or at firewall level. And uh, to provide the remediation steps, uh, we also need to figure out whether a machine is really infected or whether the threat was stopped by antivirus. For instance, the file was prevented from, be, from being executed. So going back to the uh, spikes in blocked DNS request alert, um, we actually like would probably go one by one with each domain and try to figure out whether there were some visits to this domain. So, so actually, we already know there were visits to this domain, but we want to figure out what actually traffic uh, was um, going there, whether there was like fi file download uh, from the machine or whether it was just uh, some web content visited. And uh, something that actually stands out here is these two uh, domains and um, pairing it up with the 
OS query data, we sort of figure out that it was from this particular zip cloud um, application installed on the on the machine. We uh, use also another tool for collecting forensics from the machine called OSX Collector. I'll talk a little bit uh, later about it, which allows us to sort of pinpoint um, what's on the machine, what applications are installed on the machine, um, to the browser history and uh, quarantine information from Mac OS system. And uh, if you look at the, um, so, so this, this, the way this report was generated was actually by uh, running the um, script that is analyzing OS query data. So uh, there is a script that un takes OS query output out of a particular machine and it um, compares it against the rest of the population. So for each of the spike in uh, blocked open DNS uh, alerts, we always run the um, comparison script, uh, population comparison script that is based on OS query data. And here we figured out that actually uh, there were a few launch demons that were not present in uh, other systems, like this zip cloud one that was not so popular. So that's sort of like to identify what is different about this machine versus the rest of the of the population at Yelp. Googling around the internet, we figure out like the zip cloud must be something bad. And yeah, like after the analysis, we'll provide some remediation steps. So uh, either blocking domain resolution at the DNS level or some firewall blocks for certain IP addresses if we know that there was a spe specific IP address contacted uh, by malware. Uh, we update our internal IOCs, indicators of compromise lists. So for instance, the, the bad domains or bad file hashes that uh, were identified throughout the investigation. Uh, for, this is maybe more specific for phishing related um, alerts or if malware for instance came through email, if we identify that malware came through email, we can block certain email senders or uh, put, them, put, the email send, uh, put the emails sent from these email senders in quarantine. And part of it is also whitelisting. If, um, for instance, this is like false positive, we'll whitelist, put, it, put the domain on the whitelist so it doesn't alert us anymore. And um, the last one, communication, this is sort of a, a soft approach where we just tell people, for instance, not to watch the uh, streamed videos on their corp um, corporate machines because usually malware spread through those channels like um, streaming websites or illegal file downloads and so on. Uh, just out of curiosity, do you guys, I mean, just about every business these days either host their email with Google or Microsoft like 365, is that, do you guys actually run your own email server or? Uh, we use Gmail. Gmail, <laughs> yeah. yeah. And then you're filtering it on the back end and the front end of that. Yes, yes, they provide capabilities to, to filter, uh, to add your own filter. It's, they also have some anti-phishing and spam prevention. So this slide presents um, a snapshot of, of tools that we are actually using. So uh, Sophos is antivirus, CrowdStrike for this sort of next generation antivirus, um, Cyphert, which is a network tab, so that actually analyzes the uh, mirror traffic from our um, outgoing internet connections, nice query. So all of these alerts will sort of uh, go to our uh, issue tracking system, Jira. And from that, we actually, if it's Mac OS system, we'll um, use OSX Collector to collect forensics from the, uh, from the operating systems. And we analyze the uh, output of OSX Collector and uh, contact the threat intelligent platforms like uh, Virustol or Cisco Umbrella. So Virustol is a service that allows you to query for a particular domain or file hash and determine whether it's uh, bad or not based on the um, vendors they're utilizing. Like, um, I think they, they basically utilize a bunch of antivirus vendors, uh, they group them together. Uh, Cisco Umbrella is a similar one, actually they come up with very similar set of capabilities right now. Originally they were mo mostly focused on the domain resolution data, so actually we're using them as a, our uh, DNS provider as they curate their own blacklist of malicious domains or sort of like domain scores. 
that allow us to determine whether the domain is malicious or not, and based on that, uh, block it or not. And just to recap this three steps of detection, analysis, and remediation. Um, so detection based on like endpoint protection software that we use, antiviruses or this next gen antivirus like CrowdStrike, uh, network monitoring, so Cyfort or firewalls. We use Palo Alto Networks firewalls, so that also comes up with their own like threat intelligence. Um, and we use our internal SIM security information and even my admin system to correlate, correlate the, the log streams and um, alert based on, on the information in the logs. And also some uh, ad hoc alerts from, from our employees. In the analysis step, we collect forensics from the machine. We also try to correlate the information um, through some intelligent queries to our SIM cluster. And we also have a part of automated analysis that I will talk a bit later in the presentation about. And for remediation steps, sometimes we just have to wipe the machine. Uh, if, if we have the clear sign that it's infected, it's better to say, um, uh, better save than sorry and, and rather wipe the machine and reimage the system. Uh, sometimes if the antivirus blocked the file, we can just delete the file um, or actually use, utilize antivirus to, to, to quarantine the file and remove it from the system. Um, to prevent the future infections from the same source, we will block the domain uh, if we know that it came from a particular uh, domain uh, that's spreading malware. Or if it was IP address, block it at the firewall level. And um, we also update our blacklists, whitelist of file hashes, domains, URLs, uh, email senders, and so on. And people education, this is sort of like ongoing effort that's, that also is considered part of our mediation. Um, when it comes to education, do you do a one-on-one -on -one or more like a crossroads setting type? So I think here, uh, the education, when it comes to like remediating particular uh, rat, it's probably more on one-on-one -on -one basis where we ask the help desk technician or someone who is responding and has contact with the user to just pass them the message. Uh, but yeah, we have like more organized educational programs. Um, it's, they're, they're sort of like, um, um, regular presentations for particular teams like finance, HR. Uh, and uh, so that's sort of like more in person, but we also organize um, e-learning courses through, through some e-learning platforms. Question for you. Sure. So you mentioned Splunk in, your, uh, in the beginning. Uh, do you also have like a, you know, most of the places that I've seen, all of the network security software feeds into your uh, event management system. But I'm wondering if there's also a layer of just general network traffic baseline management, because you know a lot of times these viruses kind of like spike your either LAN or WAN traffic in a certain particular way. And I didn't know if that was correlated with your kind of detection system, or is it a monitoring station that you have off to the side, or how do you? So you mean something that would be like layer two management. Yeah, on the with baseline configuration stuff. Yeah. Um, a lot of so times that's a different department. It's like that, that, that's guys. how it works. That's yeah. how it works at the LP. Yeah, I would say, oftentimes it happens that we have a tip off by our network admins yeah. about something happening on the uh, on their uh, like switches, yeah. like some some traffic saturation. Um, we, this is not normal. Yeah, What's yeah. We <laughs> so we don't have this type of information in SIM, for instance. Yeah. So so this will be like you mentioned, like different no, team. Like, every company I've been to is like that. Yeah. <laughs> These guys actually need to sit next to each other, not be in a different building or a different room. Yeah. yeah. We we're on on uh, one floor above them, so they just like you know not gonna <laughs> yeah. stealing, probably get the information on time. And here just wanted to show like how, how we actually work uh, with this issue tracking system, Jira, uh, and this sort of like detection uh, analysis and remediation steps are kind of like falling into these different streamlines that we have in the issue tracking system. So 
the three edge would be corresponding to this like detection step where we, there is incoming alert. Uh, the collection, this is something that uh, was highlighted on this earlier slide with, with the with the with the Jira in the middle and the uh, um, OSX collector forensic collection step. Uh, the analysis, so utilizing some um, uh, threat intelligence tools, virus level, um, manual analysis, also based on our internal run books that we have, and providing some remediations in the final steps. Okay. What's the timing on each uh, on this process? So do you do it just by every two weeks, or you just? Like, what, what's the time on, on the uh, ticket? On the ticket. Yeah. Um, that depends. Like, we we don't have like hard SLA set in place, but we would uh, we would love to like finish with, for instance, at least triage everything in within 24 hours, and then collection and analysis. We automated the steps a little bit, so that will be actually right now a bit faster. Um, but it can take take up to like one or two days for the analysis. And final steps, this is actually site support that takes this effort, so uh, we don't track it that much, but they have their own SLAs to um, uh, remediate the, the threat. So um, I wanted to like tell a little bit more about how, how does it work at Yelp. So uh, just introducing the sort of like uh, persons, Yelp employees, so poor chap who got his uh, laptop infected or has some uh, malware alert on the machine. We've helped these technicians who used to be sort of our first line of defense. And we have my team, security analysts, who are uh, responding to these alerts. Um, so to recap, these were like the questions we were trying to always answer, like is the machine really infected, how the malware got there in the first place, and how we can prevent further infections. And um, this is again like the, the sort of like detection analysis remediation steps with adding this um, forensic collection step because I want to highlight that in the past we actually had uh, IT engineers uh, doing this step for us. So they were actually physically uh, collecting the machine, running the, the OSX collector script to collect the forensics. So coming back to us, we are providing the uh, remediation steps and they were actually the one executing the remediation steps again on the infected machine or potential infected machine. Uh, so in between these two steps they were actually still holding onto the machine because we thought it's infected. Mm -hmm. uh, we issued the loaner machine to the employee but it could take up to like a few days to a week uh, for us to analyze and um, it wasn't that ideal situation for an employee to uh, to have Loaner machine to work on. You don't go back and say who's the troublemaker in Bando. No, <laughs> not necessarily. You're fired. <laughs> yeah, like, we don't do much of a shaming approach. <laughs> we, uh, I mean, eventually, it's like you know, it's it's not their fault, right? Like we are team security. Like we should make no, sure that. Go to the guy who's writing a malware and say. Oh, like to oh here. to oh, to that. to. Well, I mean, yeah. If this was like someone internally at Yelp. Well, yeah, we'll probably provide some remediation steps, but usually this malware is like from coming from the outside, right? So it's it's not that easy to <laughs> follow up and <laughs> do some sort of attribution where it came from. So I, I assume that you guys are pretty much a large DevOps shop. Like a lot of people are working, engineers are working in the background on Yelp's website and new features yeah, and all yeah. of that. And, and you know, a part of remediating this stuff is always having a good backup of your stuff. And pretty much that stuff lives like on a GitHub server yeah. somewhere else. So if the engineer's computer got infected, it wouldn't be that big of a deal because it's all backed up on the cloud, basically. Yeah, that's true. For engineers, like most of the code is actually you know already living in Git repository. I think the problem is mostly or, um, and I don't have a statistic on top of my head, but I think generally engineers are actually doing probably better job at like not getting malware on their machines uh, versus like your typical uh, not technical employee um, sales, HR, finance. They're usually not that tech savvy to identify that something is malicious or not. 
Um, so we actually put probably more focus on, on non-technical employees. For engineers, sometimes we'll also like diverge from the process and maybe make make it easier on them a little bit. Um, sure. Yeah. I mean, speaking of Becca, I was just thinking, you know, hypothetically, has there ever been an incident that under the radar, you know, they went through and it, it, it is populated up in your backup systems? And how um, do you deal with that? Yeah, not, not something that, well, well yeah, it, it did happen, like, for instance, when we issue loaner or where we might wipe machine, people try to back up some of the information between. And sometimes when they're not very careful, they back up some of the mm. malicious stuff as well. Or we've seen in the past, like uh, with um, Apple's time machine, it's very common that people come up with some of their own personal time machine images containing malware and we'll get alerted on that. Mm. So yeah, that's that's interesting sort of problem like maybe scanning the backups on a regular basis to make sure that they're um, safe and sound and clean up the malware. Um, so yeah, I want to elaborate a little bit more on the digital forensics on Mac OS and why we actually come up with this OSX collector uh, system. So um, way back, I think it was like around the time I started at Yelp, we were looking at the different um, digital forensics um, tools for Mac OS. There was OSX Auditor script that actually OSX Collector is based on. Uh, OS Query was, <coughs> I think, not yet available, but it soon came on um, and it was open source uh, by Facebook um, not a long time ago. Afterwards, uh, there is Knock Knock tool uh, by Patrick Wardle. He used to work at Synac and he does a lot of uh, cool, um, I don't think they're any more open source, but is they're free to use um, Mac OS tools. <coughs> Uh, there is Google Rapid Response uh, open source project uh, that also allows to automate some of the digital forensic collection um, tasks uh, on Mac OS. And there is this, uh, the, the last item on the list is a book by uh, Jaron Bradley about the, the specifically OSX as uh, a response if you're interested. <coughs> Uh, so a little bit more about OSX Collector. Uh, if you're interested, jump on GitHub. Uh, this is basically one Python script, um, several thousand lines because it's self-contained. It doesn't have any dependencies. Uh, the idea was that help this person can just come, uh, drop the script on the disk, run it, and get back the results and provide it to us for uh, further analysis. It collects all of this different information from the operating system. I think most useful for us during the investigation is actually browser history, <coughs> quarantines, install applications. Probably, well, operating system information is obviously there to like provide us some more context uh, just in case. And groups and accounts is actually something interesting. We don't have this problem anymore. But it used to be in the past that um, machines were not wiped between employees. So for instance, when someone left, they gave their machine, they just created a new account. But the whole sort of malicious stuff that was on the machine was still there. And um, right now we just make sure that every time someone is uh, getting a, a new mission, new for them machine, like it's, it's clear. Um, can you just talk a little bit about um, how an employee might figure out if there is something on their machine? Um, since I'm assuming that they don't always use it just for uh, work purposes. Mm -hmm. So how, how they are themselves sort of identifying that, that, yeah. that there is something off with their machine? Yeah, interesting uh, question. So in terms of like uh, antivirus and commodity malware, SOFAs will actually alert them, so they will see alert themselves. Um, for some more elaborate malware, I'm, sometimes they'll have questions like, you know, oh, my machine is slow down, like what's going on, or they see some um, some verbal cues like um, adware, some pop-up windows op being open and so on. Have you ever had an employee come back to you and say, or to the first line of defense and pretty much say, hey, I clicked on this machine link. Um, oh, yeah, they do. Link yeah, they do. They do. I'll talk a little bit more in detail uh, on phishing later. So, so yeah, that, that's like also one of the 
lines of how they report it. Right, we're, we're hitting you with a ton of questions. So no worries. You, you switch machines over to a new person. Do you use like an automated tool like Casper to re-image them? Or? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, the, we, we use Casper yeah. Jump. And then how do you manage the ever, ever, you know, Sam's basic a whole mantra of all his classes is your best line of defense is getting the latest OS updates. Mm -hmm. That patches your security holes. But everybody knows that in a corporate environment, they tend to break things that you already are yeah. using, like antivirus software and mm -hmm. encryption software and stuff like that. How do you manage to hold back the Apple updates on machines that are signed in with their silly Apple ID password and they're pulling it down individually? So how do we how do we manage uh, software uh, or operating system updates? So Especially in a Mac shop. it's it's a it's a good question for today because today is Tuesday. So we we do um, I think based on basically Microsoft suggestions. Um, Tuesday, patch Tuesday. So <laughs> I think it's Friday, Wednesday. It's, it's more, more, more or less regular. Yeah, it's probably. I think Tuesday, Tuesday is probably the best day because you don't want to do it on Monday because people will just come after, after, after the weekend yeah. and you want to keep them productive for the rest of the week. So probably Tuesday is the best. <clears throat> yeah, there is a lot of, always a lot of backlash around forced reboots, but uh, I think most of the operating system updates actually require you to reboot your machine. Um, so we try to give people, we, we, we learned a very hard way like how to deal with it so people don't shout at us too much um, about rebooting their machine. So we, we give them enough heads up to, to actually up do the update on their own. Mm -hmm. uh, but obviously there has to be this cutoff date. I think we, like our goal is ideally to stick to like two minor operating system versions at the time. Mm -hmm. So we have this grace period where the version one before it's still sort of uh, allowed, but yeah. Um, just because of the frequency of these updates, Apple is releasing probably every month some new, new um, OS update. Um, for Microsoft, it's a little bit easier for us. We, we don't have that many Windows machines. Uh, for, the, uh, for laptops, for PCs, the updates are actually um, applied on reboot, so provided that people actually do the reboot, they, they will uh, get the latest updates. Um, it's a bit more problematic on the servers, obviously, yeah. because of the compatibility and the uptime. And when it comes to like updates breaking stuff, we actually have a team that makes tests all of the updates before we actually uh, force them on, on the people. Is your sandboxing VM, like VMware platform? For testing, or yeah, for, for or, or yeah, yeah, we 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 we, we use VMware. VMware a lot for um, well for various tests and, and so on. Yeah. But I have a question from remote audience. Um, how do you how do you know um, or how are you sure that the malware isn't coming from a different machine or um, or that it's mutating? That's mutating. Yeah. Uh, and the FESO was how, uh, how, how, it's uh, from, from, from someone else, a different machine. So the, when you quarantine, like, it's coming from someone else. Okay. Okay. So it's not coming necessarily from internet, but like already in the network. Yeah. I guess that's what they mean. Um, yeah. So I think usually one part of the investigation and, and one way the investigation could end is that we don't really identify where it came from. Um, to, to identify that it came from like other machine on the on our network, we, we do have OS Query, for instance, that contains all of the data from other machines. So we can query OS Query population to see where what are the other operating systems with the same um, same uh, binary or same same Chrome extension, same same uh, file. Yeah, as I mentioned earlier, uh, OS X Collector, the initial script is just like one giant Python file. Um, the way it works is, well, it requires um, pseudo privileges because it um, it does go to a lot of um, um, privilege information on the operating system. And then it basically produces this um, .targz file um, that's basically a, a 
um, compressed JSON file. And uh, each line of this JSON file contains information about different artifacts on the operating system. Uh, so this particular one is a kernel extension. You can guess it from this OS collector section field here. So different sections will be identified by this OS collector under, underscore section um, label. And uh, there will be some uh, common fields in all of the, all of the uh, OS X collector output entries. Like uh, for files, this, there will be always a file hash. Uh, for most of the events, there, there, there are some timestamps there. For browser history, the timestamp will be, for instance, where, when the site was visited or file, it will be where it was downloaded or modified or um, the C time, M time, A, a time uh, fields. Actually, we don't have A time, so uh, access time uh, field, but uh, one of my teammates is working on it, although this information is not that reliable eventually uh, during the analysis. Same for signature chain. I, I got a tip off that um, the signature information in macOS, it's quite easy to be um, um, spoofed. Um, yeah, again, the GitHub uh, page for OSX Collector if you're interested in checking it out. And um, so once we have this, um, once we run the script and we have the uh, OSX Collector output, what we actually started doing, and this is sort of going back to the automation of our response process, the, the second part, what I, um, the second sort of project uh, that I want to talk about is how we actually automated the analysis of this uh, file. So we used to actually just manually grab for certain artifacts like the file name, the timestamp, and the domain name that we knew was, was bad. Um, but it was very hard to scale this process. So we decided just to script uh, uh, analysis of, the, of this JSON file at the input. Um, so we do extract domains from URLs, browser history. Uh, then we check internal blacklist of file hash, uh, file hashes or um, domains URLs. Uh, we contact external threat intel API. So I've mentioned Virustal, uh, Umbrella. Uh, we also contact Shadow Server, which is sort of a whitelist of known file hashes. Uh, we try to build sort of a graph, I would say, of related files. So files on the operating system being related to each other and deconstruct the browser history. So uh, if you have multiple browsers on the operating system, people use Firefox, Chrome, Safari, it's not always that easy to know uh, what sites they visited and in which order um, right from this initial uh, OSX collector output. So we just sort of sort them by the, by the timestamp. Uh, and the system we actually uh, package it in uh, called Amira Automated Malware Incident Response and Analysis helped us out to um, reduce this time necessary for us to collect and analyze the forensics. Um, the way Amira works is basically uh, uh, when the once we have the OSX collector output uh, actually collected through through Casper Jamf, we <laughs> upload it to an S3 bucket. Um, Actually, Casper Jamf uploads it to, to S3 bucket one, uh, after, after running it on the potentially infected system. Um, Amira picks it up from the, uh, from the S3 bucket um, based on the notifications. And basically, uh, <coughs> so we get the notification that there is a new item in the bucket, and uh, then the, 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 the TarGZ file is downloaded by Amira. And uh, it does all of the, uh, the steps mentioned before. Um, and after that, uploads back the results to the S3 bucket. So we no longer need to transfer the files between Jira and the analyst machine. Um, and also, the whole analysis is sort of uh, automated on a central service rather than on uh, each analyst machine. Uh, so the analysis results they contain basically they, they highlight the hashes domains, but domains found, found on the on our internal blacklist or uh, found through the threat intel APIs, and it also comes up with some blacklist suggestions. So if it sees something that threat intel API set set is bad, but it doesn't appear on our internal blacklist, it will highlight to add it to the blacklist. Question for you. Sure. 
I, I'm not not catching this. Is this done on an ongoing basis on all your machines and then fed through the system, or is this an on on call on machine? Yeah, this is on incident. on incident. This okay. is happening when yeah. we have the incident. So this implies you have a lot of malware on Mac. Um, a lot of alerts, but not necessarily. Not not all of them boil down to malware, and not of it. Not all of the malware or alert is, is the same. Like a lot of alerts are actually for what I think Sophos is referring to it as potentially unwanted applications. So like hardware. Um, so uh, for us, we, we try to clean them up. Um, although there is not nothing necessarily malicious right away with it, but just to stay on the safe side. I just wondered, you know, I know there's a lot of malware on Windows. I wonder how much malware you actually yeah. get on a Mac. Yeah. There isn't that much like aggressive malware on Mac. It's it's mostly I think I would guess like eighty percent of these alerts are for this potentially unwanted application, and uh, the other part of it would be like you know word attachments, which are we will get alert on them, uh, no matter if it's Mac or or Windows, but we will only take certain remediation actions for Windows machines in this case. Um, so uh, this is just sort of like a list of prerequisites to run Amira. So um, it's based on AWS ecosystem of like SQS queues, S3 even notifications. And uh, there is an optional upload to the S3 bucket, but you can, for instance, connect it to your Jira system and uh, upload the results there. This is actually something that we are utilizing since we are heavily basing our process on the, on the issue tracking system. Uh, some snippet of code just to show that, yeah, it's uh, quite simple, just connecting to the uh, S3 event notifications, SQS queue, and then configuring the results upload there. And the rest is sort of done by um, running this uh, scripts that are collecting the, the information and uh, contacting the thread dental platforms. Yeah, so sort of three easy steps to automate your uh, forensic collection. So. Uh, we use Casper Jamf uh, software management for Mac OS, so uh, thanks to that we can drop OS Extractor script on any machine we want in our system and uh, trigger the remote collection and upload it there. So there is no longer need for helpless technician to collect physically the machine, they can just uh, issue the collection remotely. So that uh, saved us, uh, there's this S3 upload bucket script, um, quite standard stuff. Or um, so that's something that the jump is running for us on the on the machine once they collected the uh, targz file. Um, and uh, here's this, this actually this remote part is called Aladdin. We're just laughing that Amira. I think one of the teammates said that Amira is like a Arabic princess. So the other service that triggers this. Um, remote collection should be called Aladdin. Uh, so, so that's um, actually we refer to this script as Aladdin. So, it, what Aladdin will do is it will look all, all of the, at all of the uh, issues in the collection state. It will identify uh, which machine is that based on the certain fields in the Jira issue. It will look up the machine in uh, Jamf, JSS, Casper, um, all this software management. Um, and trigger the analysis for that machine. And then Amira will just uh, pick up the analysis artifacts from S3 bucket and upload them back to Jira and move the ticket to analysis queue for the analyst to, to pick up and uh, finish the, the rest of the analysis. Uh, so this is basically these two steps here. Once, um, so the triage, moving from issue from triage to collection is manual. But then collection step is most of the time automated by uh, Amira, and she moves the tickets to the analysis queue. Um, and that saved us a lot of time, actually. So before the whole sort of like flow to get the uh, final analysis was one to two days, uh, now it's really several minutes to get the results. And then it's up to the load of the analyst teams to provide the uh, remediation steps for the, for the infected machine. Uh, cool. Any questions so far? 
So uh, they, they take the laptop outside. You put it on some Symantec's DNS server to say, like, here, you're going to an adult site. This is a, we'll put your DNS on that or on the um, system. Oh, there's some traffic, but you're not using it. So what program do you have uh, running in the background to monitor? And, like, <coughs> Zone Alarm mm -hmm. sends data to the server from the workstation. And do you care about that kind of monitoring where, you know, one program's talking to their server or you were like, oh, we don't really like that? So that would be for, for some applications that people have no, installed like, on their no, system? Like, um, or? Zone Alarm for the PC, yeah. it sends data to their server. I found it because I'm like, I'm not okay. downloading anything on Windows. So why is there data yeah. being sent? And I'm just thinking, how do you feel about that? If data is being sent to someone else's server versus you yeah. managing so, your data? So, I think usually we, we won't really do that much of proactive analysis of such applications unless we really, they ended up in the news and it's like, oh yeah, this app is like malicious and like it sends data there and we can block the domain on the DNS resolution level. But we don't necessarily analyze proactively uh, we don't hunt proactively for such applications. Or just activity, right? So the guy is yeah. off work at 5 o'clock, but there's still activity on his computer. Mm -hmm. Minute activity. Could be an update, could be something else. Yeah. Yeah, so the, all, all sort of like identifying the uh, suspicious activity on the network. No, on, on the computer itself. On the computer like itself. On the computer program. itself, yeah. Do you do use just to like see, oh, there's activity, but I thought he was gone for the day. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we don't do that much of the analysis, to be honest. Okay. Um, yeah, that would be more closer to this like threat hunting, I guess, yeah, efforts that uh, are sort of like very baby steps with them right okay. now. <laughs> so, yeah. Sure. So um, all of the tools in the world can't help you from a targeted, this is another, you know, somebody that really wants to get in or whatever, but like, do you, um, use uh, like encryption on your laptops so that if they take it off site somebody steals it at a coffee shop or whatever that they can't get your data yeah yeah we do have full disk encryption on all of our devices that also data encryption program or mm -hmm. okay. yeah yeah that's, uh, yeah that's something that we hope is going to prevent any sort of like threat of yeah, so hi I had a question about your DNS security system. You mentioned that you have a script that runs and kind of collects the data and analyzes it. So that script, is it, does it come with this OS X collector or is it a script that someone wrote in Yelp? Like so for DNS, uh, so for itself for DNS uh, resolution, we utilize uh, umbrella, Cisco Umbrella okay. and for so th this will be like a client on the operating system that basically changes your DNS server to, to theirs. And uh, that way, they it always goes, all of the DNS queries are going through their servers. And um, the, the sort of alert snippet I've mentioned earlier, it's basically a last alert uh, that utilizes the data that we collect from them. So because all of the DNS requests are going through their system. We also get logs from them uh, who, who requested which domain, when, all, all those data. So sure. the script is like kind of prepackaged with other tool, and then you're using it like, for your purpose? Mm. So the, the, the alerting script? Um, or yes, because you or said there's a script that analyzes the data. So I'm assuming it analyzes it like in a live kind of measure, like as it comes and it's like doing it like every minute. Yeah, that, that will be based. That, so the way ElastAlert works is uh, a little bit different than this OSX collector. OSX collector is sort of like a snapshot, forensic snapshot of a system, and the whole analysis with Amira is very like one-off for, for a particular uh, incident. Uh, the ElastAlert works a little bit different. It basically, uh, on an ongoing basis, is, it triggers this uh, Elasticsearch queries. Um, I think it's, uh, I don't remember the frequency, but it's basically like regularly, I think every half an hour or so. So it's kind of like a cron job? Yeah. It's a cron yes. job? Yes, based on the like SIM data. So all okay. the, all the like and DNS results. Does resolution. it run on each machine? Or does it run on one centralized machine yeah. and then it gathers information from each like 
it's centralized. Uh, it runs centrally. It, as a data source, it uses the, the SIM cluster. And so basically, all of the machines are uh, pushing information to the SIM cluster, like the OS, OS query information, DNS resolution, um, and, and so on. And then the data is also stored like in one country. Yeah, in Elasticsearch cluster, so that's central. So basically, each machine doesn't really have the copy of the script. It's just somewhere like in one Yeah, place. For, for this particular alerts that are pertaining to the data from SIM, that's run centrally on the, on the uh, And do you server. have like a backup for it, like if something happens to this one centralized machine? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we recently started doing uh, more advanced backups in mm -hmm. terms of like, uh, I think more clever backups. So like okay. we were backing up like deltas of information, not like a snapshots, because yeah, it's, it's, it's quite a lot of data, like uh, yeah. terabytes of data. So this centralized thing is not called, then you have some, something else that's going to kind of take over that. You had a question? Oh. <laughs> so um, on the project side, um, do you guys um, kind of drive the boat on the kind of selection of the new technologies that you have to incorporate in your entire infrastructure process to manage and monitor this? Like you guys go to RSA conference and oh, that looks like something that would fill a gap that we need and go after it? Or yeah, it. yeah. I mean, I wouldn't say we have that well-defined, like, purchasing pipeline, but yeah. whenever we identify certain gaps, uh, it's always also, like, this discussion about build versus buy. Yeah. So, for instance, tools like OSX Collector, we build it ourselves, Elast Alert, we build it ourselves. Then, actually, Elastic, Elastic, the owner of Elasticsearch, came up with their own alerting framework. So it's, it's sometimes interesting. Sometimes the, the, there isn't really that much on the market. Sometimes the, 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 there, there, is some interesting, there are some interesting products on the market that it makes more sense to purchase than uh, build ourselves. Especially in the cloud and the network monitoring. Yeah. Wow. That's similar to like how Facebook came up with OS Query that didn't see anything uh, yeah. like that. Uh, so they build it themselves. Mm -hmm. Uh, cool, so now on to some more interesting stuff. Uh, this is Chompy, our team security mascot, uh, a big fish. Uh, so what would you do if you received such email? Uh, for those of you in the back who it's probably a little bit small, they can zoom in. Open the enclosure and click on it. Down for click on it. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Basically asks you to download the bank details dot Z, I mean, Z, zip or Z file. Uh, system administrator from the vice president. Tell him to open it. Of course, they'll load the file. <laughs> 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 oh, here you're <laughs> <laughs> See the bottom. <laughs> Looks very legit. You can call them, right, and verify <laughs> whether they send it. Is that a real email? No. Yeah, I think this is a real thing we, we've received. Really? I think all of the examples I'll be showing are, are like. I, I don't think I modified them. <laughs> yeah, we, yeah, we received something like that. Um, so a dot .z, does that do something on Mac? Uh, I think it's like a zip archive. Uh, I'm not sure if it was dot .zip or maybe it's, it's oh, yeah. not. It, it, it's, it's like a maybe cropped image. But yeah, it, it was like that. It was, it was archive, I would assume. I don't remember what was in this particular one. Actually, I looked it up. Uh, it was, I think, the message. So. When we receive something like that, um, and the way we actually receive it is we ask people to report to us um, the, 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 the suspicious emails or whatever suspicious things they see uh, to fish at Yelp.com. So we have this like central uh, reporting place. And I think this particular one actually came through this channel. Uh, so we receive this email. We actually have access to all of the emails as a security team through Google Vault. Uh, so we query the uh, the vault. We get to like the the very raw source of the email. We try to analyze that, um, look for any sort of like IOCs, uh, indicators of compromise, like malicious domains, IP addresses. We analyze the um, file attachment with Sandbox. So actually, CrowdStrike has uh, Sandbox. They actually bought a Sandbox and, and they incorporated it into their software. Uh, Cypher has 
Sandbox as well, Virus Total. Um, what is a little bit tricky is Virus Total, when you upload a file sample, is actually shared with everyone else on the internet. So we don't do it for things that we suspect are our internal mm. uh, documents, because we don't want to <laughs> share them outside of our network. Uh, but Sideford, for instance, this is a hosted solution. So we uh, have a sandbox in our infrastructure that we can send the uh, file sample to and get analyzed. So, is that one of those companies that like charges you a bunch of money for a hundred, hundred submissions a month or something like that? So that's Virusol, okay. I think. Because for for Cypher, it's like we, we have the the appliance, so we okay. we just have uh, like the sandbox is part of like the appliance capability. Okay. Uh, they use sandbox to mon to to um, to test the, the, the samples they, they yeah. get from the network tab, but you can also access the sandbox and upload your own file samples if you want to. Okay. Actually, if, if you download the file from the internet, it already goes through Cyford, so you'll <laughs> see the yeah. results probably. Yeah. Some of it happens when we are analyzed. I was just actually chatting with my teammate about this today. So we always have like double alerts from Cyford because when Cyford alerts us on something, then we go and we fetch it ourselves on a, mm. Uh, on a virtual machine that we use for analysis, it goes again through the network, so we see the same uh, signature sort of firing. When did you start using Virus Total for yeah, their feature? I think they didn't have it um, that long ago, right? For checking websites or IP addresses, right? They just had it like maybe a couple of years ago, because before it was just check a file and that was it. Mm -hmm. um, I think it was around the time I started, like 2014, and I think they already had this capability then, if I remember correctly. Um, but yeah, I think Virusol started more from this like file sandbox yeah, file, sandboxing yeah, perspective, and then they moved to URL and domains. Uh, umbrella differently, like their treasure trove was domains, and but now on. How long was the umbrella for? It, or when did it start, as far as you know? Sorry. Uh, the, uh, the other feature, the other yeah. Cisco company, the other Cisco umbrella, yeah. Uh, umbrella, how long? Well, you know, when that started or when you started using it? We started using it, I remember we, it, I was already there, so it must have been like 2015 or so. I'm not sure about their intelligence part because the service they provided from the very beginning was um, just a DNS resolution. And then they also provided this threat intel part that allows you to query uh, for domain score. And one more thing, how about like gray list? You know, you, you type in, you know, a domain, you know, a domain. Uh, you'd make one character mistake. It's like, oops, do you have a, like a gray list? Um, like you type Best yeah. Buy, but instead of typing Best Buy, you type a one mistake character. Yeah, so sort of like to, to prevent like going to a domain like type of squatting. Just by one character, you, yeah. you screwed up. So, look. This is not something that we will actively try to prevent. We, we do it for like Yelp type of squatting. So if someone tries to, um, I guess like Yelp with one instead of L, that looks pretty much the same in, uh, in, in certain fonts, uh, we will put this on our blacklist or actually I think we'll try to buy the domain as well <laughs> just to make sure. Oh yeah, but, uh, the other way that uh, But if we, but that would mean that we have to like buy all different combinations. So that, sometimes we'll just put it on the blacklist and just black hole it if someone requests it by mistake with like fat fingering this URL. Yeah, most of the time your workers would make the mistake. Yeah. Well, I want to go somewhere be uh, shopping before I leave the office and they'll make the mistake of typing that one character that they shouldn't have put in. <laughs> yeah, for like for external sites, we would just rely on uh, Umbrella to blacklist it for us, I guess. Okay. Unless it's like, okay, we discovered some malicious traffic and then block it ourselves. Yeah, we'll, we'll do it as well. Um, yeah, uh, some other examples that we see all the time is the, like credential phishing, so credential harvesting. So people will, will receive uh, emails like, oh, please open this attachment leading <laughs> to websites like that. Uh, it's interesting that you can log in there with any email provider. So very cool, <laughs> but not really. Um, Office 365, uh, we don't really use Office 365 at the Yelp, but at the same time, it doesn't prevent people from putting their password there. Um, and um, Dropbox, another sort of uh, quite uh, elaborate example. This one actually looks very good. Um, 
but if you obviously look at the domain name, it's not Dropbox. <laughs> Uh, so some of the examples we've seen in the past, and um, yeah, uh, what's wrong with this tree? <laughs> so, <laughs> so th these are very, uh, these are some of the examples, actually not, not, not all of them, but yeah, there are, there are some of the examples of the passwords we've seen people using in at Yelp, uh, why this is bad and why like we care specifically about this is because yeah, if people get fished for such weak passwords and they reuse them among different uh, systems, uh, that's pretty bad. Actually, in this case, like they don't even need to get fished for like Yelp 2018. This is very easy to guess. Uh, so that's why we decided uh, and also motivated by the penetration finding, uh, penetration testing findings. We decided to. Uh, implement active uh, directory password blacklisting. Uh, if you're interested uh, in more details about this particular project, there is this uh, blog post on our engineering blog. It's quite recent from uh, April, uh, written by uh, my teammate Liren. Uh, it's actually quite simple. Active directory allows you to add or register a DLL library uh, with password filter capabilities. So this will basically tie into the password reset flow and it will uh, give yes or no to the main interface whether the password can be changed or not. So you can intercept the password at any point and have various filters uh, checking different password policies. Um, we also decided actually to increase the minimum password length to 12 characters. So passwords like Yelp 2018 are no longer valid anyway. Can you say how you decide those are bad passwords? Is there a simple rule? The, the, so how we actually came up with the blacklist? Yeah. So we took like top 1 million passwords from the uh, existing um, like databases available of like uh, password leaks and so on. And yeah, or like dictionary. Yeah. I mean, we actually filtered them out. Uh, we filtered out a lot of passwords because our password policy would not allow them anyway. So that led us with like maybe 10,000 out of them. And then we added some like Yelp specific ones, like the C Yelp 2018. This is no longer valid, but for instance, like Yelp Yelp 2018 or uh, some uh, some combinations of these. And actually, generating the initial blacklist is maybe not that important. You can even start with like nothing on the blacklist. I think what is really important is having the sheer capability of blacklist passwords. So if you discover that some passwords got leaked, you can just put them there and uh, make sure that no one in the future will utilize the same password. Yeah, that's sort of uh, a lot of this. Go ahead. <laughs> and how did you come up with the 12 uh, character long passwords? So we used to have eight and that was not enough. So we decided, okay, 12, it's probably <laughs> makes more sense. And is that pretty recent? Or yeah, that's like as of last year, I would say. Uh, don't remember which month exactly. Um, yeah, password, passwords and password policies. And uh, this is a very interesting topic that NIST has a lot of <laughs> things yeah. to say about, but uh, people don't necessarily agree on. One interesting related topic is how often should you force people to reset their passwords? Uh, we do it every year, but people still complain. So, okay. yeah. complexity level, do you guys suggest that? I think having the capability to blacklist passwords, we could probably lessen this expectation, but uh, this is a very recent project. We just finished it in uh, March, April, so we still want to get a little bit more comfortable with with this new toy in our arsenal. Does that only blast your poor Windows people? Because there's no active directory for Mac. Um, well, we th this is for this is for Mac as well. Oh. Like we, we use. Oh, you feel we, it we, we, Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. We, we use AD for everyone, not Yelp. Uh, you have yeah. a question. Hey, you kept on saying uh, Casper. Were you saying Kaspersky? Casper. Casper uh, Jam JSS. This is. Uh, uh, Operating system management tool for Mac OS specifically. What kind of OS? Uh, Mac OS oh, is Mac? for Mac. Yeah. It's, it's not the Kaspersky antivirus. Like 
SCCM for Mac, basically. Sort of. Thank you. Yeah, it like allows you to centrally manage applications installed on a device, uh, or like for onboarding when people get a new device. Uh, on like bare image, they can just get this initial uh, Casper suite, and then everything is like installed. It allows us to manage centrally the, the machines. What about for uh, do you uh, give uh, mobile devices to your workers too? Uh, no, we don't. But uh, I think I know where you're getting with this question. <laughs> uh, so people do use mobile devices, their personal mobile devices for work. And uh, this is something that we are looking very closely at this year and get into all this uh, buzzword of BYOD, being your own device, and how do you sort of protect that uh, vector from uh, being exploited. Mobile iron is very good. Sorry? Mobile iron is very good. Mobile iron, okay. <laughs> I'll put it on my yeah. uh, short list. <laughs> short list. Uh, thanks. Uh, not sure if it's explained on this slide. OPF stands for uh, Open Password filter, uh, filter, I believe. It's an open source library that provides this uh, password filtering capabilities. So we utilize that in our uh, password blacklisting project. So it was quite. I wouldn't say, say easy because Liren spent quite some time digging into some very obfuscated C sharp code to actually uh, implement it. And there was a lot of forth and back with our uh, corporate engineering team that manages uh, AD servers. It's quite isolated environment, not very uh, friendly to test and so on. Uh, yeah, and the last topic, really really quick, security education. We recently actually purchased uh, Wombat Security. Um, they're very cool. They allow us to fish our people, <laughs> so send phishing simulation emails. And uh, the other part is uh, their trainings. So we are starting with introduction to phishing. We're going to roll it out, hopefully, to the entire company by the end of the year. We are starting with the most uh, uh, what product is that? Wombat, Wombat Security. Yeah, yeah. Um, they recently got purchased by Proofpoint. Um, Proofpoint is doing email security. Um, so it's sort of an interesting space where everyone tries to get into right now. Uh, a lot of companies are running their own um, security initiatives when it comes to providing their own trainings. We went sort of with a hybrid approach. We'll have on ad hoc basis trainings um, for finance, HR, uh, for the people in our headquarters. Mm. But sort of to scale it across the whole company, we also decided to purchase this uh, train, like pre-made trainings. Uh, it has some pros and cons as everything. Uh, pros is obviously that we don't have to create the same material for Pretty much every company has the same problems when it comes to fishing, so the training is quite standardized. And the cons are that we have quite specific approach to fishing, for instance. I think in their training, they suggest employees to do some sort of investigation of whether email is fishing or not. We tend to um, advertise to be rather uh, safe than sorry and forward it to our fish at yelp.com email alias rather than try to investigate yourself. Um, but yeah, this is sort of a uh, constraint that we have. Um, yeah, one last thing. Uh, Before yeah, go ahead. Go to that, uh, because actually when I was walking around, I was pretty surprised that you did such a campaign around the whole young building, putting all even like, um, yeah, a lot of announcements like just send this and that. How was the response from people? And did they overreact? Like did they report a lot or they did? or how was that response? Yeah, so uh, I think what Clara is referring to is we have the poster campaign in all our offices to advertise this fish at yelp.com uh, alias and to uh, ask people to forward anything they see, uh, anything suspicious they see to this email alias. Um, so this campaign is already running for like at least two or three years. Uh, and we definitely see the spikes. So what we actually do, uh, we started in 2016. Uh, October is National Month of uh, Cybersecurity Awareness, something like that. Uh, 
So we do Hacktober. We actually, I think, stolen the idea from Facebook uh, because our uh, head of IT used to work there. And uh, every October we'll have some sort of funny activities uh, related to security. Uh, like we'll fish people, we'll give them some prizes if they report or not. Uh, so we definitely see the spike of reports when we have these activities running, when we actually tip off people that they should be on the lookout for something suspicious. And obviously it a little bit dies out. Um, but I think on average it's, it's working quite well. Uh, people obviously tend to report false positives, like something that they are not sure, but we try to make we try to not scare them away. If they report something that isn't really malicious, we'll just thank them and say like, oh, it's clear, okay. Like, don't hesitate next time to forward to us. Anyway, if you see something that looks even a little bit suspicious. Um, the other sort of side of the coin is that while you can't really trust everyone, they're always like newcomers, uh, people are, at least I am very lazy. <laughs> People are lazy as well, they won't have time, or, or they won't have time to forward to fish at yelp.com. So you have to also think about some other preventions, uh, prevention methods for, uh, against that, against fishing. Cool, and with that, I would actually like to invite you to the happy hour that we'll be hosting um, next week on Wednesday. Uh, there is a link there in the bottom, I think, uh, I'm not sure if you, I think, Clara, you posted it probably at the forum, so uh, like hopefully have website. access Is to it. Is it a secret? Or can no. I just put it on my website? Open, yeah. I think you should, um, maybe not necessarily, because this is like public website, right? It's sort of like a limited capacity yeah. event, so we, we didn't make that whole event public. Uh, but yeah, if you have like some internal forum, like you can share it there, definitely. Like yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think we have like space limited, like 100 people, right. but um, there are still some open spaces there, so um, I think sure to. So this one is like one off, really, and it's, I'm planning to make it very informal, uh, like pizza, beer, like no, no, no particular presentations or anything like that, just to hang out. Uh, well, let's see how, how this one goes. Maybe we'll do it more regularly. Um, just a quick question about since we're students and we're all at one point going to be looking for um, entry level opportunities, mm -hmm. uh, what do you guys um, kind of look for? Do you take someone with entry level, like coming out from a college? Yeah, so yeah, we definitely have openings for new grad students. Um, I would say. It's never too early to apply and try your luck. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, we definitely hire a lot of new grads. Um, so, so there are always opportunities for, for that as well. Uh, I think internally for security, that obviously sort of depends on where we are with our team. We have right now around 20 people and it's quite well balanced between uh, people with experience and new, uh, new grads. Um, there is always like plenty of possibility to learn on the job. So I think we're definitely looking forward to um, talk to everyone interested in, in, uh, in applying. And do you provide mentorship when there is a new grad or is there a like, specific track that they go through? To well, um, we provide mentorship to every new hire. It doesn't really matter if it's a new grad or uh, someone already with the experience. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's sort of like a standard newcomer package. It's like you get mentor. Um, I think what's really cool about the Yelp is that everyone is there to help you. So, I mean, you will have your mentor, but like, you know, after the first week when you know everyone on the team, they'll help you out as well. And um, I mean, I, it's, I, I wasn't fresh grad out of school when I started. I was already with a few years of experience, but there was still plenty to learn. Um, and actually my mentor was a new grad <laughs> at the time and I learned a lot from him. So. Um, that was a really cool experience. So yeah, uh, Chompy wants to say thank you for attending. And if you have any questions, I'm um, you find a lot of answer. bloggers on your or anything uh, anything uh, uh, in particular that you would mention? Bloggers. Uh, some machines that you know that you sent to Virus Total that should should be out on on the lookout for. I mean, we definitely have seen keyloggers uh, like. Uh, 
as, as like the commodity malware. I have to mention that like most of the stuff that we see is commodity, so not really either targeting specifically Yelp or not something really elaborate like you know Stuxnet or <laughs> whatever wanna cry. Uh, it's always like they're just trying to get in, like with stuff that's like you know ten year old that already mal like good antiviruses are catching. Uh, but yeah, they, they, there is still always a way in. How about remote users? Have you come with them? Not, you know, since their home security is sort of lousy, you push the VPN in, any stories on security on that side? You're like, oh, someone made a mistake, so just because it's secure, you know, there, there was compromise at home, so. Yeah, so there are like sort of That's two things. Like, one advantage is that because they're on their home network, yeah. I mean, Worst that can happen is like their home network will get infected, and this is not really like well. We obviously don't want this to happen, but like it's not really our problem at this point. Uh, so for us, the big problem is yeah, like how do we protect the perimeter on VPN and also like all of the internal applications access. So once someone, for instance, went through the VPN and they uh, managed to um, compromise that uh, that. Uh, access control, like how do we prevent them from sort of like laterally moving in our infrastructure. So sort of providing this uh, checkpoints so they cannot pass anymore. If they Everybody to. likes it, I just wonder how often does it get hit. Yeah. You mean like the, the, the VPN? Yeah, I mean, you know, every like that? that service, that connection, everybody says it's great, but there must be some drawbacks with, with Using it, right? Well, we're using VPN. Using VPN, yeah. Besides yeah, yeah, yeah. There are a lot of the robots. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, one, one sort of a lot of, another effort that we are uh, also doing some sort of baby steps. Um, I was actually talking about this during RSA week. Um, uh, it's this whole Beyond Corp idea of um, basically not trusting anyone and not having a solution like VPN that basically gives you a keys to the whole kingdom. Like once once you log into VPN, you have access to the whole Yelp, right? It's zero yeah. trust network. Uh, exactly. So this idea is around like zero trust networks and, and beyond the core, but that's Google. Well, a cross application where like someone comes in as a sales representative for you or associate and then they become a technician. Does that happen a lot? Like they came in as one person. Mm -hmm and then transfer to another department. And then they keep the whole access that they had. Yeah, they were like, you know, oh, they got into sales because it was easier than get through tech. Mm -hmm. Does that really work or no? I mean, we definitely have people that transition yeah, that, that around the org. Yeah, they through sales, but I, like, I want tech. Um, I feel like, um, yeah, this is, a, this is a good scenario. I would have to, maybe like during our next instant response drill, I will have to test that one. Uh, what's our response to that? But um, I would assume we, we definitely have like a very specific set of onboarding actions and offboarding actions. I would assume that probably falls into like offboarding them from their previous role and onboarding into a new one. Um, I think actually like across such distinct orgs as like sales, for instance, and engineering, um, there isn't really that much access that salespeople have access to, uh, and I think. The more interesting part is like someone moving around in engineering because if they move often, they may collect all of this like admin access to <laughs> different systems. <laughs> and how do you actually oh, take it away from yeah, that? I see. Uh, so some ideas power. there is yeah like doing regular audit or also making sure that all of the access rights that you uh, give people to it's temporary or you at least have some sort of solid process around reviewing it on a regular basis. Uh, Obviously, it's time consuming and, and hard to enforce, but uh, hopefully, yeah, that's like a long term vision for us to. How about a web reviewer? Do you have anything like, you know, people find, like, oh, if you're a bug bounty, people get paid money? Do you have anything like that going on? Like, yeah, we, we, do have, we, we do have ongoing bug bounty program for. But also, like a web reviewer. Oh, someone reviews the website and they're like, oh, this looked boring, or this didn't. You know, people who write reviews and they're like, yeah. oh, if you like their review, they get paid for it. Anything like that going? For the website. Yeah, so for for any sort of what we call a spam activity or any sort of like. Not okay. spam, it's like like you have people that review websites and say, yeah. oh, I think this could be improved by such and such. 
And if that works for your company, you would pay them some money for it. Just a thought, you know, from the website, yeah. the outside yeah. looking in. Right? So, um, I mentioned Span, like the, the team, like actually they got rebranded. I think they're called Trust and Safety right now. Mm -hmm. But they're basically dealing with all the uh, paid, automated, or in any case, like influence reviews. Mm -hmm. uh, but what they do, we don't really share outside. It's this sort of secret sauce that uh, it's always like an arms race. So we can't really reveal that much because someone can game the system, right? Yeah. Um, Similar here, right? Like uh, probably showing all of the different alert rules that we have would give attackers the advantage because they will know which avenues not to pursue, and they would rather focus on something that we have blind spots around. Uh, so same in the si trust and safety team. So because all of this, what we are doing, is not that public, uh, I, I would have hard time to think how someone from the outside could contribute. No, yeah, I know. Because yeah. I always hear, you know, well, you want someone to write a web page. You want someone to do some programming. But it looks like no one really cares about how their website works or how bad it is, how good it is compared to any other company. So that's the impression I got. Uh -huh. Everything's internal, yeah. But the front look of the company doesn't seem to matter to people as much. Uh -huh. The first impression, you go to a website. Yeah. It takes too long to load. Yeah. Load good on my cell phone versus on the computer. Uh -huh. Yeah. And if I use Chrome versus Firefox, how will it react? So well, let's have a QA team. Oh, QA team, yeah. Because yeah. 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 I hear, like, oh, this is most important, and this doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. yeah. Cool. Yeah, um, so yeah, if you're interested, obviously we are <laughs> higher. So your department is that information security engineer? Is that your department? Um, information security, I think all different postings, like, uh, uh, security engineer, information security engineer, and um, yeah, I think that's the two openings that we have currently. That's this. Do you uh, take interns? Uh, we do have regular internships. We have quite well-oiled intern program. Uh, actually, there is intern on my team starting on Monday. So um, hmm. yes, we we do have. Because we've got a hiring fair that happens once or twice a semester. I should really invite somebody. Who should I contact? Uh, I'll give you the name. I think it'll be someone from our and Shrek department. Yeah, that would be great. And I know I also got contacted about the apprenticeship program. Yeah, that's um, right. That's I'm another. trying to figure out like the logistics. Hopefully, yeah, this will be one of the other okay. tools You're that already people involved. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. This is great. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks a lot. And uh, yeah, uh, I think you have my contacts probably you post these slides on the, the website. Right. Um, they're public. I. You can, if you just copy the link, I'll send you the link. Actually, I've sent you the, the Google Slides link. It should be accessible to oh, anyone yeah. with and the I link. Post, I can put it on my webpage. Yeah, right. yeah, you can, you can put it there. Okay, thank you. Awesome, thanks a lot. <laughs>